Forget everything you know about 1 litre mini PCs. Forget Dell, forget HP, and especially forget Lenovo. Acer has been doing it better for years, and almost no one noticed. This is the Acer Veriton N6640G, and it has a handful of tricks that make it an excellent choice for your home lab. In the interest of getting straight to the most important part, it has a full PCIe by 16 slot, which is something we don't often see on systems like this. This is especially interesting because if you want an affordable mini PC with a PCIe slot, you'd be looking at the handful of Lenovo models that include one internally, like the M910X and the M720Q, and they're not bad. They are, however, rather limited with significant size and thermal constraints. You miss out on the SATA connector for extra storage, and the cards you can install are limited by the size of the case, as the major components like the CPU cooler get in the way of installing a full height card. There's also the challenge of keeping the cards cool, although as many people do, you could just cut a hole in the top of the case. So, this is what I believe might just be the best possible solution to the limitations of the 1 litre form factor, although that 1 litre categorization doesn't make the most sense in this case, but it's close enough that it still mostly counts. Anyway, the whole point is that while Lenovo thought inside the box, Acer did the opposite, and their thinking outside the box makes this a rather capable system. Why, after all, should you try and cram a PCIe slot in an already compact form factor when you could instead put it on the side of the motherboard and cut a hole in the case? That was rhetorical, but it seems like an obvious solution in hindsight, and one which I don't think anyone else has done, as most companies seem to opt for an internal slot with some form of riser. Anyway, this one cost 70 US dollars when I purchased it many months ago, but the specific eBay seller I bought it from has since raised their price. It has an i5 7500T, 8GB of DDR4-2400 memory, and a 128GB Samsung SSD. I must, of course, comment on the fact that this is a rather old system now, from 2018, and that 7th generation Intel processors are rather outdated, but the reason for covering such old hardware is simply because it's all the budget for this video allowed. There is, however, an entire lineup of models of these, and for many people it may be beneficial to purchase one with an 8th or 9th generation Intel processor for the higher core counts and improved efficiency they provide. I won't, however, be testing those, but I would like to in the future. But you may be wondering, what's the catch with this design? Well, there isn't one. No, really, the PCIe by 16 slot doesn't have a catch at the end, making the cards easier to remove. Okay, seriously though, one catch is that these aren't exactly common. Since I bought this one a few months ago, they've become somewhat easier to find, but they're nowhere near as common as the equivalent systems from Dell, HP, and Lenovo. Sure, they exist, and it is possible to buy one, because I have one here, but a search of eBay when I purchased this originally revealed to me about half a dozen listings, none of which were located in the United States. That's not a problem for me, but a quarter of my audience is from the US, so I felt it was important to mention. These also haven't had much attention on home lab forums, something which hasn't changed significantly since I found out about these over a year and a half ago. Back then I found maybe a dozen posts or comments mentioning them, and they're still at a very similar level of popularity now, at the time of writing this at least. Information about them online is limited and contradictory, so there's a few things that I'm not entirely certain about as well, which will become apparent later on. This system shipped with an AMD R7 430 2GB graphics card from 2018, which only has 8 PCIe lanes connected and is generally not very good. It may be useful for tasks such as basic video encoding, and with the integrated graphics, it would be easy to pass the dedicated graphics card th directly through to a VM, but it's still an older, lower-end card that I personally wouldn't consider particularly useful in 2025. The original purpose of this card, of course, was almost certainly to provide support for extra monitors, an assumption I feel alright about making, considering systems like these are sold in bulk to businesses and governments, and for that intended use case it would have performed very adequately. While I've removed it, there is a case extension to expand the system's width in closing the card. This case expansion does only house a single half-height slot, but without the case you can install pretty much anything and could modify the case expansion by cutting it to support a taller or thicker card. Anyway, the hardware itself is, for the most part, fairly conventional, but we will still go over all of it. We've got an Intel Socket 1151 supporting 6th and 7th generation processors, 
although whether it supports 65 watt processors is unclear from the information I could actually find online, and I don't have one available to me to actually test that. Certainly newer models were sold with 65 watt processors, but I don't know if the N6640G does support them. In terms of the rest of the hardware, there's two DDR4 sodium slots, an M.2 M key slot for NVMe SSDs, and an M.2 E key slot with the all-important PCIe support. On the front of the system we find a microphone jack, headphone jack, and three USB 3.0 ports. On the rear we find DisplayPort, VGA, three more USB 3.0 ports, a gigabit NIC, headset combo jack, space for an optional extra port, in this case DisplayPort, and a barrel jack for power. There is no USB-C anywhere on this system, which may be important to some, but it does appear on newer versions of these systems, which are worth considering for the newer processors, although I haven't personally tested those. The heatsink design of this system is interesting, and in my opinion may be more complicated than necessary. Instead of putting the processor in the rear of the motherboard with the fan in front of it, the processor is at the front of the board, making this setup with a heat pipe to reach a copper heatsink in the rear necessary. A good bit of thermal design I found is the three thermal pads underneath the motherboard, which should transfer some heat from the components they touch on the back of the board into the case. Also, in an absolutely baffling design decision, the CMOS battery is located under this rear section of the heatsink, meaning you absolutely have to remove the fan and the entire heatsink to access it. Yes, that's an entire eight screws to access the battery, which might genuinely be the worst CMOS battery placement I've ever seen. So bad that I honestly find it funny. And yes, you would have to repaste the processor. And no, you can't remove the heatsink without removing the fan because the fan blocks two of the heatsink screws and the standoff for the third fan screw is attached to the motherboard. Truly a strange and poorly thought out design. In terms of ease of disassembling this system, compared to other mini PCs I've worked with, this one isn't amazing. To remove the motherboard, you start by removing the graphics card, and then removing the metal case extension that houses the graphics card, and then remove the front piece of the case that covers the I.O., and then remove the fan, then the heatsink, and finally the board can be unscrewed and removed. It doesn't lift upwards nicely though, I found it had to be lifted up slightly and slid forwards out of the case to avoid damaging the board. It's not all bad though. The M.2 SSD slot features a toolless clip instead of a screw and a standoff and has two locations for it, also supporting shorter 2242 SSDs, although I'm not sure how useful that would be, but maybe there's some non-SSD add-in card you can install that I haven't thought of. The build quality of the case itself is generally acceptable, although the fit of the case panels isn't particularly good. On its own, the top of the case fits well and is easy to install and remove. But with the GPU expansion installed, the edge of the top cover gets stuck between the case and the expansion, requiring quite a bit more force than expected to remove. The top cover for the GPU expansion doesn't fit well at all, and the metal tabs that slide into place are difficult to align correctly. I do have some concerns about the rigidity of the expansion case, as it is only held on with four small screws and has quite a lot of flex when attached to the system. It is significantly worse with the top cover removed, but even with it installed, it's clear that the side of the main system's case which the expansion screws into is not rigid enough. Anyway, other than these minor build quality issues, in effectively every major way, including price, these Acer 1 liter mini PCs are on par with models from the three other major brands, making the entire reason to choose this system, at least for me, the PCIe slot. Certainly, when I bought this, I had expected the slot to be locked down in some way, maybe restricted to specific cards or otherwise non-standard because that's a thing that has happened before with some systems, but it seems to be perfectly normal. What then can we do with the PCIe slot? Well, firstly, single slot half-height graphics cards do exist, and it did come with one which isn't very good, but modern ones could potentially be a good upgrade for this system, although I haven't tested them. I wouldn't personally use this as a gaming system, but it is probably possible. In terms of the expansion case for the graphics card, it may be beneficial to modify it in some way to improve ventilation through the top, as although there are holes in the side of the case, that's not where the fan, at least on the stock graphics card, is pulling air from. Another suggestion may be to install one or multiple small fans to pull air through these holes in the side. What I'm really interested in though, is how this can be used in a home lab. The first thing I tried was this Intel X540 T2 10 gigabit NIC, but unfortunately it doesn't work and would freeze the system during the post sequence. 
The problem here is almost certainly something to do with it being a HP flexible LOM card with an adapter, because every other PCIe card I tested worked fine, and these are known to have compatibility issues with some motherboards. I did try covering the SM bus pins with some tape, but that didn't fix the issue, and I just ran out of time to find a real solution. While I can't be certain, I suspect the issue is related to the card, not the system. On the PCIe card situation though, every other card I tested functioned fine, with one major exception. Meaning I have no doubt a more conventional 10 gigabit NIC would work fine, but keep in mind that you may run into compatibility issues with cards intended for service, just like I did with this one. That's not to say there won't be 10 gigabit NICs which work, but that I don't personally know which ones will, because I've only tested this one. Being a mini PC, you're quite limited for storage, but that PCIe slot can be used for things other than networking and graphics as well, such as this SAS HBA. This could potentially be used for some of the custom DAS enclosures I've been seeing on various forums, and would serve as an excellent replacement for the M.2 M key SATA cards that some people use which have significant reliability issues. That is to say, it's a more reliable solution to actually connecting storage to a mini PC, even though the system itself doesn't really provide any space for that storage internally. What you lose, however, when using HPA is the potential for higher speed networking since there's only one PCIe slot, but a possible solution to these is the fairly cheap Realtek Gigabit and 2.5 Gigabit cards that can be installed in the M.2 E key slot and screwed into the back of the case where the extra display port was previously installed. I did, of course, test this Realtek RTL 8111 model, and it worked fine, although something to be careful of if you install it in this opening in the rear of the case is to prevent it from shorting out on the barrel jack underneath. I would just use some Kapton tape for that, although I couldn't find any when I did this. That exception to compatible PCIe cards that I mentioned earlier is then an RTX 3070. The slot does not support the full 75 watt power draw, meaning that while just on the desktop, a GPU like the 3070 will function fine, but attempting to run graphically intensive workloads causes the system to immediately power off, even with the 135 watt power supply for the system and a perfectly adequate ATX power supply connected to the GPU. Although I completely expected this outcome, I did test it anyway because I wanted to be sure. I haven't been able to confirm exactly how much power draw the slot is limited to, but I found one source online suggesting 66 watts, and others suggesting somewhere between 50 and 70, which, as mentioned earlier, is one of the bits of information about this system that I wasn't able to confirm in my research. The original AMD graphics card should only draw about 50 watts of power, and newer cards do exist which can draw less than 75 watts from the slot, but most graphics cards, while technically compatible, won't really be usable. Network cards and HBAs, however, won't ever get anywhere near close to this maximum power draw, and there are more modern graphics cards that should work fine, at least in terms of power draw. These limitations, while significant and important to keep in mind, don't present much of an issue for home lab use cases, which is what I'm interested in anyway. What I find to be important is not just specifications or raw performance, but upgradability and customizability, and I think this meets my expectations rather well. Something to keep in mind is that many of these systems shipped without either expansion, but as far as I've been able to find, they all still have the PCIe slot and just have a cover on this side. The easiest way to be sure you're getting it is to purchase one that is advertised as having the graphics card expansion, as if it has a discrete GPU, it must therefore have the slot. That is, of course, only applicable to buying used. So, are there any major limitations or notable issues? Well, hardware-wise, there's nothing major. It does, however, lack a second M.2 slot for SSDs, which is something you'd expect to find on a newer system. Also, 7th generation Intel processors are rather old now, and in spite of their affordability, newer systems with newer processors offer better performance and efficiency for the money. There is also the PCIe card size limitation if you're trying to keep it within the case expansion. Removing the case expansion removes most of the support for the card, which could prevent potential risk of damaging the card or the slot on the motherboard. For a taller but single slot card, you could always just leave the top cover of the expansion off, but for a card with a thicker heatsink, some modification to the case may be necessary using a tool like a Dremel. Still, the potential for modification is there, Unlike with the Lenovo's, where installing a full height card inside the case is effectively impossible without using a PCIe riser cable, and then it wouldn't fit inside the case anyway. 
So yes, it's not a perfect solution to the PCIe card size problem. The expansion isn't perfect. As far as the 1.0-litre mini PCs that I personally own, I'd say this case is built better than the Dell Wise 5070 Thin Client, but worse than the HP ProDesk Mini. And as discussed earlier, it has some build quality concerns, specifically the flexing of the case expansion. Also, it's not really 1.0-litre, in spite of the general use of that as a category of mini PCs. Without the PCIe expansion, the Acer is roughly one and a quarter liters, and with the expansion, it's slightly less than one and a half liters. The most significant problem, however, is the relative lack of availability of these systems on sites such as eBay, at least compared to other models from Dell, HP, and Lenovo. When I purchased this one, I found roughly half a dozen listings, and although there's substantially more now, the pricing is rather inconsistent, and availability in certain countries still isn't amazing. Also, it absolutely will not fit in a 10-inch rack with the PCIe expansion installed. The expansion increases the total width to 25 centimeters, or approximately 9 and 3 quarter inches, which is technically less than the 10-inch width of a 10-inch rack, but it won't fit between the rack rails because of how 10-inch server racks are actually measured. Certainly, that is a disappointment for me, because I now have two 10-inch server racks, but it's still a good system, and those upsides, a full-size PCIe by 16 slot, make up for the downsides, in my opinion. Overall, I'm rather happy with the Veriton Mini N6640G. Just as a mini PC, it is generally quite good, and is competitive with similar models from HP, Dell, and Lenovo, but that's without even considering that PCIe slot, which almost entirely solves the problem of expandability in 1.0-litre systems. Sure, it's a bit less compact than other models, but this design is in my opinion, more thermally sound and doesn't completely eliminate the possibility for installing a 2.5 inch SATA drive if you have the drive tray. In my opinion, this is better than the Lenovo's, which have a few limitations. Firstly, actually fitting the PCIe card inside the system. Secondly, the proprietary riser. And finally, the risk of purchasing a system that doesn't have the PCIe slot soldered to the board, because yes, that is a thing. Not all Lenovo Tinies of the ones that can have PCIe do actually have it. I can't say for sure the Aces do, but every single one I've seen so far online does. Certainly, I think this is a rather interesting system for home labs, and one I think might be worth considering. Thanks for watching, I'll see you all next time.